Hey everybody, my name is Adam Neely, and I'm here answering all of your questions about bass and music in general. So, let's get started. Juan Pablo Martinez writes, Level 7 reminds me of the true level bit in Rick and Morty. After listening to it, equal tempered harmony sounds crooked. Oh, everything's crooked! Reality is poison! I, I want to go back! Yeah, I think that analogy is pretty good. And there are actually a couple other people who reference that Rick and Morty sketch, so I think it's fairly apt. 12-tone equal temperament can sound fairly crooked, but to be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand jazz level 7. The harmony is extremely subtle, and without a solid grasp on extended just intonation, most of the music will go completely over a typical listener's head. Sean Barnett writes, What are 6-9 chords? <sighs> okay, it's finally come to this. We're talking about 6-9 chords. 69 chords. Let's go. So the most basic way of adding color to a basic three-note triad, like C major, one that's built in thirds, is to simply stack another third on top of the basic triad, creating a seventh chord. The C major seven chord, and other seventh chords like it, form the basic harmonic vocabulary of jazz music. But there's a pretty big problem with them. Can you hear it? Yeah, it's this guy. It's that really intense rub between the B and the C, which doesn't create a restful feeling when we end up on the C chord. You see, in the key of C, we kind of want our C chord to feel restful. It's home. It's the tonic chord. It's the point of resolution. Almost philosophically, everything points to a C chord which wants to feel relaxed. Adding that seventh in there might create a nice and colorful chord, but it won't feel as relaxed as the basic triad. So what do we do? Well, a lot of musicians have substituted that seventh for the sixth degree of the scale. This sixth degree of the scale creates a major second dissonance up against the G of the C major chord, which is a lot less spicy than the minor second dissonance of the B up against the root of the scale. Chord progressions which end on the C6 chord end up feeling really nice and relaxed. It doesn't feel like we need to go anywhere in particular, which is exactly the point of a tonic chord. Now, where can we go from here? Well, the C6 chord sounds relaxed, but it might not feel as colorful as the C major 7. So to get some more color in there, a lot of musicians started adding the ninth degree up from the scale, giving us the glorious, the one and only, 6-9 chord. One of the nice things about the 6-9 chord is that you can employ this particular kind of voicing in the piano right hand. You can start with the ninth degree of the scale, stack down a perfect fourth to the sixth degree, down another perfect fourth to the third degree, to create this nice chortal voicing. Chortal voicings have this very particular quality to them. If you actually just move fourths around in a given key like this, there's like this feeling of the chord being almost like resolved and unresolved at the same time. It's a fun rainy day activity just to move this right hand shape around in C major. In fact, if you just like lightly, lightly play the piano, it's like, you know, raindrops, rainy day, fun stuff. You can also have minor 6-9 chords. So if you have a 5-7 chord in the key of C minor, you could resolve that to a C minor 6-9. Why would you want to resolve it there versus a C minor 7? Well, you can hear they're very different in quality. This feels fairly resolved. It doesn't really want to go anywhere else besides where it is. We know we are in C minor. Basically, the point is here is that whether you're in a major key or a minor key, that seventh of the chord creates color, but it also feels unrestful. By substituting the seventh of the chord with a sixth and also adding the ninth, you've created a tonic chord that's both restful as well as colorful. And that, I think, is pretty neat. Emerson Chavez writes, Why did this appear in my feed? I don't even like jazz. You might not like jazz, but YouTube's recommendation algorithm certainly does, so... Research shows that our... Algorithms... Love jazz. Undular Production writes, Hey Adam, are the colors you use to mark up different notes in the scale the colors you see for those pitches? So yeah, in recent videos, I have been coordinating my synesthetic response to different examples. So for me, the letter A, and therefore the idea of the musical note A, is red. B is black or blue, C is yellow, D is kind of a teal, green, blue situation, E is purple, F is green, G is brown. Now what I was finding is I wanted to add a little bit more color to my videos just to make them more exciting and fun for the kids. But the problem was the color couldn't be arbitrary. Like for me, I put so many hours into editing my videos to make sure that they look right, and this, this looks so wrong to me. 
This looks terrible. Ugh. This looks so much better. So what that means is that for me to get my videos to look right, I have to draw on my synesthetic responses. And the problem is, is that synesthetic responses differ quite wildly from individual to individual. What this means is that if you have synesthesia, I'm so sorry for this. This looks and feels completely wrong to you probably, but because that is my video and these are my reactions, this is how I'm gonna edit it. So deal with it. Luigi Vecchio writes, Could anyone name me any jazz pianists from our days that would be considered analog as far as influence on young students to Mark Juliana, Nate Smith, or Ari Honig as drum players? I found these three very inspiring. Yeah, so of course, one name that I definitely want to mention is Corey Henry, an amazing keyboard player and organ player who's worked with Snarky Puppy and his own group, the Funk Apostles. And I think one of the reasons why he's so influential is of course his incredibly perhaps overrated, but in some ways maybe not overrated, solo on Snarky Puppy's Lingus. I think for a young generation of musicians, seeing Corey Henry effortlessly blend all of those chord substitutions from gospel traditions as well as jazz fusion traditions in that video is just incredibly influential. I think that it is one of the most influential solos in jazz of the past 20 or 30 years. Part of the reason why that solo was so influential, of course, I think is because of the visual nature of it. In a YouTube video, you can see him playing and the band's reactions to it. You can see improvisation at a high level level. And I think for a lot of people, that was their first introduction to what that kind of improvisation is. And honestly, it's pretty amazing. Beyond Corey Henry, though, I think Robert Glasper has had an enormous amount of influence on young jazz pianists. Monstrously good jazz pianist. I love his trio work with the bass player Derek Hodge and Chris Dave on drums. But of course, he's brought a lot of hip hop elements into jazz music and also vice versa. He's brought jazz into hip hop. He's worked with people like Kendrick Lamar. His particular approach to voicing and creating grooves is incredibly influential. You hear it everywhere. And honestly, I think that you wouldn't even have the genres of like lo-fi hip hop or lo-fi jazz without the playing of Robert Glasper. Now beyond Robert Glasper, I might say Tigran Hamasian, who's an amazing Armenian jazz pianist who has brought a lot of Armenian folk music into jazz, but also has done it in a way that like is very, uh, shall we say, gent metal -y. He's influenced a lot of progressive metal musicians like Animals as Leaders, especially his album Mockroot. That is a very de jazz album if there ever was one. Then you have keyboard players that take like the Robert Glasper thing to the next level. Uh, people like Anomaly, who is a French Canadian producer who has like these crazy intricate arrangements with lots of patch changes, interesting ideas about how to take electronic music production and combine it with the jazz vocabulary. Then you have people like the young French pianist Domi, Domi de Gaulle, who's really into this like grungy DIY fusion thing. She's worked with Louis Cole and she has this great project with the young drummer JD Beck. Anyway, I just wanted to shout out some of these names who I feel like are especially influential on modern jazz piano playing or who I feel will be influential in a couple years. Lasalica writes, at 219, the A7 sharp nine chord has a B sharp as ninth and not a C natural because the ninth of an A chord is B natural and here ninth sharped. So B natural becomes B sharp. Great video anyway. So yeah, in my last video, I wrote an A7 sharp nine like this. A, C sharp, G, C natural. And yeah, technically you're right. If you take the ninth degree of an A chord, a B, and you make it sharp, it's not a C, it's a B sharp. A B sharp is enharmonic to C, it sounds the same, but C is the minor third and B sharp is the augmented ninth. However, we would never write an A7 sharp nine like this, and there's a good reason for that. The interval between G and B sharp is the interval of an augmented third. It's a third because there are three letter names in between G and B, G, A, B sharp. This presents a problem because on the keyboard, it looks like a perfect fourth. And so most jazz pianists I know prefer reading it this way versus reading it this way. This issue of the augmented third interval in reading gets even weirder once you start adding more tensions to this chord. Like for example, if this was an A7 sharp nine with a flat 13, this F on top, Technically speaking, yeah, you would write it like this with the B sharp. The problem is the distance between B sharp and F is one of the weirdest intervals you can possibly think of. It is a doubly diminished fifth, which doesn't look right at all. This is a perfect fourth on the keyboard, and this is a perfect fourth down. It's so much easier for a pianist to conceptualize perfect fourths rather than a doubly diminished fifth and an augmented third, and so we write it that way rather than writing it the way with the B sharp. This is an example of a little knowledge being a dangerous thing. Yeah, technically B sharp is the correct way of writing it, 
but it's also the incorrect way of writing it because of all these extenuating circumstances surrounding that decision to write it that way. Sometimes the wrong answer actually ends up being the right one. Metallica Rocks 911 writes, what does vibed mean in the context that Neely had mentioned in the video? Okay, to get vibed by another musician is to have that other musician give you negative energy, whether through passive aggressive comments or a look or anything really, because they feel like you are not playing music well enough to their standard. Now weirdly in jazz culture, there's kind of a tradition of vibing and the supposed justification is that it keeps musicians from being complacent keeps musicians from being lazy if they're constantly being driven to be the best musicians that they can be and uphold the craft. That's the thinking behind vibing anyway. But in my experience, vibing is just a bunch of insecure musicians taking out their insecurities on others and it is an incredibly toxic and low activity and I don't have any room for vibing in my own personal life. So if you see somebody getting vibed, just say no. Just say no to vibing, everybody. Let's make the jam session a vibe-free zone. Let's say, that's killin', and yeah, man, more often. A little positivity goes a long way. Carl Youngblood writes, How does one actually play level seven live? Amazing new frontiers, but kind of solipsistic, lonely composition in a way. I mean, it's definitely possible, but it is extremely difficult. The string quartet music of Ben Johnston relies very heavily on this extended just intonation approach to harmony. And there is a reason why I called the seventh string quartet of Ben Johnston the most difficult piece of music. Uh, it's because it's very hard. To be able to manipulate pitch on that granular level requires many, many years of practice, but it is possible, maybe not on a piano, but on a fretless stringed instrument or with voices, yeah, but it is hard. Time the Avenger writes, can you talk about overcoming stage fright? I've never been able to rationalize away my feelings, uh, the feelings of anxiety when I'm on stage. I've never been able to think my way out of stage fright. Instead, these feelings, and I honestly think most feelings, are embodied, like it's a physiological reaction to the things that you're feeling. And so the best way of approaching it is training your body to react differently, not your brain. With that in mind, the miracle catch-all cure for stage fright has always been breathing. Focusing in on inhaling and exhaling and really making breath the center of all of your attention and trying to let everything else go. I don't think the importance of that breathing cycle in overcoming stage fright can really be overstated. It is very, very important. So if you're feeling terrified before you get on stage, try breathing. And actually a good exercise is to try breathing with somebody else. It might feel a little ridiculous to do collective breath with another person, but it works. You'll be a lot less anxious on stage. Obvious throwaway writes, Question for your next Q&A. Let's say you lost your fingers calluses for whatever reason, being working on production, started learning a different instrument, got a job, whatever, and you have to play a stringed instrument in a week. Would putting your fingertips on a hot griddle for a second help you get your calluses back quick? Okay, so first of all, please don't burn yourself. That sounds horrible. Don't do that. I've never heard of anybody doing that, and probably for a good reason. That doesn't sound like a good idea, please don't do that. That said, there have been instances in the past of me playing upright bass and plucking hard with my fingers where I haven't had that time to build up the calluses. In those instances, I have used a little bit of super glue, crazy glue, and put them at the tips of my fingers, let them dry so I had a little bit of a coating to survive and get my way through the gig. Not the best idea. Use that as a last case scenario if you desperately need it to survive a gig situation. But otherwise, just suck it up. A little bit of pain in the fingers is way better than just burning your fingertips. That sounds horrible. Please don't do that. Esther Bester writes, Wait, I only just found out that you're half of Sungazer. I've been listening to this stuff for a little while already, a handful of songs scattered into playlists, and I figured you'd just like the band whenever I heard it in your videos. Ah, that's cool. I'm glad that people are finding my band Sungazer outside of my YouTube channel. It's kind of cool to hear that, you know, you're listening to Sungazer because it's just cool music and not because it's YouTuber Adam Neely's band. So, that's cool. If you happen to be a fan of Sungazer, my band, and the band that provides the background music for a lot of my videos, uh, we're going on tour this fall. I have the link in the description of where we're going. It's gonna be a short tour. There are gonna be longer tours next year, I swear. But if you want to come out and say hey, we're gonna be playing, we're gonna be touring with Shib Saran, and uh, it's gonna be a fun time. So. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy my videos in general, please thank my patrons over at Patreon. And uh, yeah, here is a Sungazer outro. Hope you enjoy.
Peace.